Good afternoon. Uh, I am Andy Rich. I'm Dean of the Colin Powell School for Civic and Global Leadership at City College of New York. It's our School of Social Sciences. And I want to welcome you to Leading for Social Change at a Critical Time. What do leaders need? For the past nine months, the Colin Powell School has partnered with the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies to identify the potential for a new initiative to support social justice organizers and leaders at the early and at the middle stages of their careers. The planning is led by Gara LaMarche, the president of the Democracy Alliance and a senior fellow and instructor here at the Colin Powell School, and by Deepak Bhargava, distinguished lecturer at the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies, and for 16 years before that, the executive director of Community Change and Community Change Action. I'm gonna turn it over to Deepak in a moment for him to moderate today's conversation. But the idea for a new initiative here at CUNY is born of conversations that the three of us started having well more than a year ago now, well before the pandemic. And even more, it comes from discussions that I think each of us had had separately over a number of years with many more people, including many people joining us today, that, that points to the need for a greater investment in the professional development of social justice leaders, folks who are organizers, advocates, policy people, people working on particular issues and working to build power and bring change. The effort we have in mind is premised on the concern that there are too few on ramps to social justice careers, particularly for people of color, for women, those from lower income and working class backgrounds, and that there are too few systems of support for those who are in their early and middle stages of their careers. A consequence of all of this for too many people is early burnout and career shifts, and our movements become weaker as a result. So this initiative aspires to address these challenges and create space for healing, for community building, for mentorship, and for deep thinking about how our strategies and tackle, tactics tackle big ideas, large ambitions, and shift power. Many of us at CUNY are excited about it, and today's event is a first public conversation about our findings over the last nine months and the context for them with two members of the initiative's advisory group, Christina Jimenez, the co-founder and former executive director of United We Dream, and Ense Ufa, CEO of the New Georgia Project. Before I turn it over to Deepak, I wanna mention that we have a second event already planned, and I wanna encourage you to add it to your calendars. Two weeks from today, Tuesday, March 2nd at 12.30 Eastern, uh, we will host Leading for Social Change at a Time of Crisis, Lessons from the Front Lines of the 2020 Fights for Democracy and Black Lives. It will feature Gara LaMarche in conversations with uh, Rana Epting, the executive director of Move On, and Maurice Mitchell, the national director of the Working Families Party. We're gonna put the link for that event um, so that you can RSVP in the chat, and I hope you can join us then. Now on today's, today's discussion, um, the first portion of today's program is a conversation among Deepak, Christina, and Ense. But the Q&A is open throughout the event, and we'll get the questions in the last portion of the today's discussions from the Q&A, so please feel free to share them. Um, we are recording today's event, and we will um, post it on both of the school's YouTube pages, as well as at The Forge. Thanks for being with us today, and now let me turn it over to Deepak. Thanks so much, Andy. I'm uh, really thrilled to be moderating this discussion today about what leaders need in extraordinary times with two of the most brilliant, strategic, and effective leaders in America, bar none, Ense Ufat and Christina Jimenez, and I'll introduce them in a moment. I first wanna just share with you a little more context for today's discussion. As Andy said, since last summer, a team at CUNY has been conducting research on what's needed to support emerging leaders, particularly people of color and women, to pursue careers in social justice. And uh, the teams included um, over 25 movement leaders, including Christine and Ense, and many academics, organizers, and practitioners working at the cutting edge of social change. And over that time, we've interviewed young people with a passion for social justice who want to figure out how to get started, dozens of mid-career organizers of color who are looking for support to take the next step in the movement, and leaders of national and local social justice, progressive and labor organizations. We also conducted some research on how conservatives 
invest in leadership development and how that differs from what progressives do. So some of our top line findings are that the new social movements are driving a huge wave of talent. People of color, women, folks from low income and working class backgrounds, first gen folks, queer folks to seek out careers and lives in social change. And these activists are in a sense, our biggest asset as a movement. They bring tremendous gifts uh, to us, but our leadership mm -hmm. development efforts are really dwarfed in scale by the investments that conservative mm -hmm. leadership programs make. Conservative leadership programs are not only bigger, they emphasize long-term cultivation of leaders rather than just discrete trainings on particular skills. And the conservative efforts emphasize topics like history and worldview, what's the world we seek to build and create, and how we actually acquire and wield power. Young people find our movements hard to navigate. There's no clear path or map. And they raise hard questions for us about sustainability, the need for practical paid experiences, the need for mentorship. And as members of oppressed groups, they raise to us questions of how to deal with trauma. So we heard from mid and senior level leaders in our movement that the leap into top level leadership is a big one. And that supports for mid-career folks um, need to be strengthened dramatically focusing on things like strategy, movement history, cross issue, cross constituency work, public leadership and management. And finally, we really heard uh, across the board a tremendous hunger for a scaled leadership center that would consciously focus on supporting early and mid-career leaders, leaders of color, women leaders, queer, first gen, low income leaders and folks from working class backgrounds that focus not just on one or two skills, but on all the dimensions of leadership with a conscious goal of shifting power in society and in our movements. So our two, two schools at CUNY are now seeking to build that kind of center that would work in partnership with movement organizations and leaders. And today we're gonna to explore this topic of leadership with two people who embody the very best of it. Ensay Ufat is CEO of the New Georgia Project and the New Georgia Project Action Fund, which have played a pivotal role in the political transformation of that state by registering and empowering voters of color. We saw the fruits of that genius in the January election, but there were years of work out, out of the limelight to cultivate leadership that Ensay led and paved the way to do. She's a longtime organizer, including a background in the labor movement. And I'm thrilled to see her on TV now, like uh, commenting and telling uh, elected officials how they need to deliver for the folks who deliver for them. It makes me really happy. Um, Christina Jimenez is co-founder and former executive director of United We Dream, which is the largest organization of immigrant young people in the country. She's built a powerhouse organization that led the fight to win DACA and has helped tr really transform the whole narrative about who immigrants are in our country. And as with Ense, Christina did a lot of work over many years to support um, the leadership of other immigrant young people that has been pivotal to winning the victories. Um, I also wanna mention, she's the author of a magnificent chapter in a forthcoming book that I co-edited, Shameless Plug, Immigration Matters, Vision, Strategies, and Movements for Progressive Future, which you can order. And Christina is also a proud CUNY alum. So um, we're thrilled to have both of you with us. Um, can't imagine two leaders that we would rather launch this uh, journey with. Um, so Ensay, I'm gonna start with you. And I think the first thing to say is um, thank you on behalf of the whole country and all of us here in New York. It's kind of hard to contemplate the situation we will, would have found ourselves in if it had not been for the hard work that you and your colleagues did in Georgia. And we should all be aware the battle is not over in Georgia or nationally. And, um, but I, I wanna take some time to really honor and appreciate the progress, not the victory maybe, not the final victory, but the progress that's been made through the lens of leadership, your leadership and all the leaders that you've helped to develop over time um, and I guess my framing question to you is that 
our country, our culture tends to think of leadership as something that's highly individualistic. We look at the charismatic star and we focus on the one big speech, the one heroic event. But from what I've seen and observed, the Georgia story really includes a lot of charismatic leaders and a lot of big moments. And there's a story here about long-term building and investment. And especially, I think this is important to underline, by, led by, of, and for, women of color that produced this mammoth win. So I'm wondering if you could take a little time to, to break that story down for all of us. Um, uh, so A, thank you for all of that. The only thing that I would edit to your question is led by women of color for all of us, mm. right? Um, so yeah, and say, um, I think that it is very much a gift uh, and a curse, uh, you know, an honor um, to do this work in Atlanta, to do this work in Georgia, uh, to do this work in the Deep South at, at such a time as this. Um, a, you can't throw a stone without hitting someone that will tell you that they marched with Martin Luther King. Um, and what that means is that they have very clear ideas about uh, what it takes to win, uh, what justice looks like, what a campaign looks like, what a leader looks like. Um, and you know, every day we get to defy convention, conventional wisdom um, and show in real time and not necessarily talk about it, but show uh, uh, a broader uh, definition of leadership and a broader definition of what it looks like to win. Um, and so, yeah, I, yes, um, I would say that, uh, you know, one of the critiques often, um, well, one of the early critiques of, for example, the movement for Black Lives was people were frustrated because they couldn't identify the leader, right? Like, who's the leader? Who's the spokesperson? Basically, who's the target? Um, and folks would not and could not accept the notion that it is a leaderful movement, the idea that uh, there is accountability uh, and that you know we all have a role to play uh, if we are talking about winning. I think that um, we in this moment, particularly in the New Georgia Project, but also throughout the state of Georgia, have sort of dispensed with the notion of a superhero, right? That is is at the, at the center of uh, you know, the story about how we win and how we're liberated. Uh, so the idea that we, Stacey um, Abrams likes to say that we don't elect messiahs uh, because that hasn't served us in the past. And so we work really hard uh, to exercise that muscle to make sure like, and then in the simple things like rarely taking meetings alone right that there's always a comrade a colleague uh, a mentor uh, a, a junior organizer that joins us in meetings um, but also the idea that there is uh, that the, because people hadn't done this as their nine to five that this was their five to nine, that in a place as hostile uh, to the multiracial, multi-ethnic, progressive majority um, like Georgia in some instances, that there are tons of people who've been doing this work to keep us safe uh, and to keep us connected. And again, it was their five to nine. Um, and one of the the things I'm most proud of about the New Georgia Project is being able to identify those leaders and bring them into the organization that we're building um, so that that work uh, can continue uh, regardless of personal and professional competing obligations. So. That's beautiful. And I'm hearing a lot there about the leadership investment not being an activity, but really being built into the culture of how the work is done, how organizing is done. And so Christina, a similar question for you. I, I had a chance, the privilege really to be part of some of the early trainings and gatherings of undocumented youth leaders in the early 2000s before United We Dream existed in this current form. So a lot of attention has been rightly focused on the huge win that immigrant youth won with DACA. But I want you to tell us a little bit of the story of the victories from the point of view of the long-term investment 
in grassroots leadership among undocumented, low-income people of color, women and queer immigrants? Or what happened off stage that most people didn't see? Um, first off, um, I just want to say it's such an honor to be here with Ense, with you, Deepak, and with Andy. Um, and I am so happy and excited about this uh, leadership center. Um, and yeah, lo really look forward to um, collaborating with you all. Um, so really great to be here. I mean, I'll, you know, um, I'll think about your question in the sense of what happened behind the scenes that a lot of people don't see. And that tends to be the leadership development, the political work that it's sometimes invisible to people, but it's actually the invisible work that makes all of the other work able to happen. Without it, we're not, we just can't run campaigns. We can't lead our advocacy efforts. We cannot achieve wins and change. Um, often be invisibilized. And of um, my had uh, hundreds of undocumented young people uh, that were part of the space at the beginning. And the space was created in a way where it was safe. It was safe for you to be undocumented, for many uh, folks to come out not only as undocumented, but also as queer. And people often talked about coming out of two closets. Um, and it was also the space where people were finding their voice. And for us, it was important because one of our values and one of my values as an organizer is that people in justice ought to be the ones leading strategy. And quite frankly, they're the ones in best position to come up with the solutions that we need for the change that the country needs to see and the breakthroughs that we need to see. But what that means is that we have to do a lot of intentional work, not like the side thing that we put on, you know, the list of things that we wish to happen or that will happen at some point, but it needs to be an integrated part of our organizing models. And for United We Dream, this became um, one that we were creating spaces uh, of uh, where everyone can be their true selves, but that meant us having a conversation about values and grounding our space around the values and the communities that we wanted to build. It also meant that we needed to create structures for training and coaching that were part of our campaigns, of our training programs. And over time, it became really clear to uh, the point of your research um, that you mentioned earlier, Deepak, that when people closest to the pain are the ones leading this, the work for the solutions that we want to see. That also means that we have a lot of people that have long experiences and history of oppression and trauma and pain, and also of joy and community. And those, those two are true. And what that means in terms of our work is that we need to create spaces that also support the whole person, not just the organizer or the activist, but that looks at the whole person. And for United We Dream, that meant for us to integrate healing into our organizing and, to, and into how we created spaces uh, for the work that we were doing. Um, so it did mean for us that we had to do um, all of the integration through our training to also how we supervise and train staff and manage teams and to always be grounded that we were building to the point that NSA race, not a movement or an organization center around uh, one person, but that we were building a leaderful movement um, that needed to look at the whole person when it came to our organizing and our training programs. That's fantastic. And I, I want to ask both of you, since you are exemplary leaders that many people look up to in our movements, if you can talk a little bit about your each of your own leadership arcs. So one of the themes that came up in the research that we did was the need for on ramps and at, at early points in folks careers, and also supports um, at the mid career point, um, who invested in you? Um, what, what are some of the experiences that shaped you? What are the qualities that you've cultivated in yourself that have proved critical? Um, how have you invested in your own, your own development as a leader? And Christina, maybe I'll start with you. 
Um, I, you know, really appreciate this question because it just made me think about all of the people who invested in me, um, who um, I was looking up to as mentors, and maybe they did not even know <laughs> that I was looking up, up to them <clears throat> as mentors. But I will say that, you know, there's two things that I will raise here. One is that organizations uh, that are community-based, that are grassroots, that are often entry points for people like me. You know, I grew up undocumented um, with a lot of fear and shame about my experience, about being um, undocumented and, uh, and being open about my undocumented status in, in New York City. And um, what became an entry point for me were community-based organizations like at the time Latin American Integration Center that you know, became Make the Road New York, um, and the New York Immigration Coalition, a state-based advocacy organization that were you know, somewhat established community advocacy organizations in our communities that um, created spaces for me to be exposed to advocacy, to organizing. And I also think about the student structures that were there for me. As a, as a, as a college student in Queens College, I. Um, part of CUNY, I became part of our student government. And the first organizing formal training that I had um, was the training by the United States Student Association that was led in partnership with the Midwest Academy. So I think about the amazing Heather Booth and all of the founders and leaders that have come up through the pipeline of USSA. And I thank them because thanks to their work, I was able to get my first organizing training and to realize that even though I didn't know I was organizing, I realized in the training, oh, I'm already doing this and I could get better um, at, at organizing work. Um, so community-based organizations, student organizations, colleges, campuses are all entry points for many of us who do not know that these are even career paths or things that we can you know, get paid for or get a job at. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, that's important to remember how important organizations um, and schools are in our communities. The second point I will share is all of the women in particular, when I think about the trajectory um, that I had uh, over the last 15 years, I, I, con I constantly identify women that played a, a key point in my life um, in seeing in me what maybe I did not see myself, what I did not see in myself. Um, so I think about um, Ana Maria Archila, who was a co-executive director of Make the Road at the time. And she uh, gave me the opportunity to have my first paid um, uh, job as, an, as a youth organizer. And I said, oh my God, I can't believe this woman is going to charge this college student that has not had an organizing job before to run our organizing program in Queens, in New York City. Um, and But she saw potential in me. She coached me. She mentored me. And along the way, just like Ana Maria, I can think of um, many women organizers who have been there for me, uh, not only in the trajectory as an organizer, but also in building an organization. Um, and I found conversations where I could feel and be vulnerable to say, I don't know what I don't know. Um, you know, I was the first ED of United We Dream uh, right after my master's program at Maru College in the School of Public Affairs. And um, it was finding those people that were my mentors and coaches along the way uh, that really supported me in the most vulnerable of moments or when I had I, what I thought a crazy idea um, and they were uh, supportive and, and ready to listen. And that, you know, is part of what I think is also part of my role um, in, in doing that with other folks that are coming into movement work. Mm. Really important lessons there about the importance of movement infrastructure and also of mentorship and of having folks who really are willing to invest and take time and take risks and help bring people in. Beautiful. Um, so Ense, similar question for you. It, uh, it seems from some of what I've heard that you've had a particularly important uh, relationship over the years with Stacey Abrams. And I want you to talk about your own leadership arc, kind of who invested in you. Uh, you had a long career before Georgia as a labor organizer. Like there's a, there's a whole Ense story. Um, what were some of the pedal experiences that, that shaped your, um, development and also how have you invested in your own development consciously as a leader? Yeah. Um, okay, all like 
big question, important. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I think that um, one, uh, you know, I'm an immigrant and I became a US citizen my senior year in high school. Um, and so when I think about my early days um, and, and when I think about my identity now, um, I think part of it is because of, um, you know, older Africans who had come to the US um, in the 60s and the 70s as a part of, quite frankly, the brain drain, right? Immediately after um, independence, uh, where many of the sort of best and brightest from Nigeria and Ghana throughout the continent uh, were sent to the US and to Europe to be educated and to come back and be world builders. Some of them stayed. Um, <laughs> some of them stayed in Atlanta. Um, and so thinking about my parents, young immigrants with a young family um, who were looking, you know, uh, for a village, looking for a community, um, looking, how do we take care of each other? Uh, how do we like make this place our new home? Um, and so just the concept of a village and that uh, we are accountable to other people, that uh, we are, you know, it, it is our, our responsibility to sort of pay it forward. Um, so those are things that have been instilled in me as, an early day, but, and I wanna be clear that it wasn't something that was inherently born with, that there were a group of people that decided that this is the world that they wanna build for themselves, that this is the world that they wanna raise their children in, um, and this is the world that they wanna work in and thrive in. And so committing to, uh, you know, working and developing my individual leadership, uh, so my individual sort of skills and abilities, and in and in, in in contribution to this world that we are building and to this community that we are accountable to. So I think that when I think about my organizing model or theory, when I think about my leadership, it is 100 percent through a lens of accountability to real people and a real community, people who will come and see me um, <laughs> and have things to say um, if, uh, you know, I am seen sort of moving in a world, through the world in a way that um, does not uplift uh, the community, the village uh, that I identify with, that I'm a part of. So there's that, right? Um, and that is from, from, from youth. Um, when I think about my formal education, um, you know, I think growing up in extreme poverty, uh, you know, like really intelligent parents uh, who were educated in Nigeria um, and then had to start over school again because uh, U.S. institutions didn't recognize um, uh, their education. Uh, but, you know, anyway, growing up an immigrant, um, an African immigrant, in the deep south, uh, in a poor and like working class family, um, there was this idea that formal education was important, but it wasn't going to be enough. Uh, that I needed to go and join all of the groups, all of the clubs, right, to get exposure uh, to the world around me. Like if there was what, like some really generous white people were taking a group of public school kids to the to the farm <laughs> to go so to understand life. And so the idea is constantly um, taking advantage of opportunities that were presented to me, but also seeking them, um, just wanting to understand the world around me, wanting to understand, uh, you know, poverty, uh, why I was experiencing it, racism, sexism, again, really wanting to sort of dismantle and put back together the world around me so that I could understand it um, and trying to say yes to as many opportunities as possible. And so literally a combination of mentors, community folks, uh, you know, is in the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, and again, the idea is one, um, you know, we didn't have a television growing up. So wanting to make sure that there were, uh, there was enough activity in my life uh, to sort of distract me, to occupy my time, to occupy my mind. Um, 
and then, you know, I grew up, uh, graduated from high school, graduated from undergrad, graduated from law school, and poor kid, you graduate somewhere near the top of your class, you go highest bidder, because that's what you do. You make your parents proud. Uh, and so worked for an energy company. Uh, and it was terrible. I mean, I was good at it because, I mean, my name is my name. Uh, and that's super important to me. But it was, I was not happy. Um, I do not think that that is what my ancestors wanted for me. Um, and so began to do a series of informational interviews, was living and working in Ohio at the time, um, ended up up getting a job with AFSCME, the Public Employees Union, um, and uh, was, you know, didn't know much about labor, A, immigrant family, B, uh, right to work state, growing up in the deep south. Uh, so moving to Ohio and going to work for AFSCME, um, gave me um, a sort of solid commitment about not only leadership, but that there was a real way to invest in leaders, that there was a way to build your organization, that you built a pipeline, that there's a way to have a succession plan. And it doesn't mean that people are plotting against you uh, and like waiting to push you out of the organization. Um, the idea that, um, and so, and at the time, the leaders in the labor movement in Ohio were old, they're very, very white and they were overwhelmingly male. Uh, and so coming in uh, and being mentored basically by a group of old white dudes uh, who, um, but had a, a clear definition about power, about who has it, who doesn't, why we need it, how we deploy it um, and starting to think more strategically. And so anyway. I fast forward, I have these mentors who don't look like me, who come from a world, who develop their world view and their analysis and how to win from completely different contexts than my own. Um, I meet one of my dearest friends. One of my dearest friends introduces me to Leader Abrams. Uh, I, at this time, okay, fast forward. At this time, I'm living and working in Canada. My organizer friends uh, jokingly say that I had gone into uh, organizer or activist retirement, right? And that, that's to say that, that let's be clear, that, that working people and those of us who believe in freedom um, absolutely have to continue to organize even in the Canadian context, but it's a little different when um, labor and people power isn't seen as an existential threat. Uh, so living in Canada, working in Canada, get a call from uh, my friend who says, do you know Stacey Abrams, uh, minority leader Stacey Abrams? She's a state rep in your hometown. Are you coming home for the holidays? I say, yes, of course, but you know, I was such a jerk. I was like, I'm here, I'm just gonna be with my family, et cetera. Um, fast forward, we have brunch because that's the national pastime uh, or at least the local pastime in Atlanta. Uh, we talk about her vision for Georgia. Um, and again, uh, this leader, she was the minority leader in the Georgia state legislature. Uh, they had nearly a two thirds, uh, like a super majority. And so her leadership has been defined by coming from behind. Uh, <clears throat> by negotiating a path forward, by keeping the opponent at the table. Um, and again, and by, uh, and, a, and a rigorous and like, and a fidelity to the numbers, um, which I shared. Um, and yeah, we started talking about the ecosystem that the idea that there's a bunch of legacy civil rights organizations. Again, there are a bunch of people in Georgia who remember Dr. King, who remember organizing and that nearly 2 million people had moved to Georgia in the past decade. Um, the overwhelming majority of them were people of color. Um, many of them had come from the coast and political sciences and demographers were calling it the reversal of the great migration. So there were these young tech entrepreneurs, these young um, HBCU college grads who did not know about a Georgia uh, from the you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And if there's an opportunity to fortify, to build an ecosystem where we pour into each other, where we support each other's ideas, where you know there's the reinforcements, like the idea that there was no cavalry coming. We spent tons of time going across the country trying to spread the gospel of Georgia. People didn't believe us, uh, but we continue to chop wood and carry water, invest in each other's ideas, believe in one another. Um, I think peer mentorship is definitely a way that I would frame um, how we built what we've built and how we continue to win in Georgia, in the Deep South, in this moment. 
It's such a powerful story. I hope it turns into a book because we need to learn literally from that playbook. Um, so some of the themes around cohorts and peer mentorship and the ecosystem language that you used, very powerful as we think about what we collectively need to do going forward. So I do wanna dig into some of the hard stuff around leadership in our, um, in our world. So I wanna talk about um, something that come, came up consistently in our research, but it's just a reality about race, gender, and class and leadership. And how do they, in your experience, figure into who's seen as having leadership potential in the dominant culture, but also in our progressive movements, how do those dynamics just play out? Because they do. And what are the barriers that prevent the full expression of the leadership of people of color, women, immigrants, people from working class and low income backgrounds, queer folks, not coming from the perspective of deficit, there's something that needs to be fixed about people, right? But what is it that's actually preventing the existing talent from um, finding its fullest expression? And what's worked? Because you both have position many, uh, many, many leaders um, in a whole variety of settings. So yeah, I just want you to get into the, the race, class, gender, and other dynamics here and your thoughts on it as people who have, um, have done this work. And Christina, maybe start with you. Um, I mean, I think that this is uh, such an important question as we think about our movements and leadership because systematic racism, oppression, sexism, um, classism, quite frankly, all come into play even within our progressive or social justice movements. And that the way that that manifests itself is from looking at who leads organizations and who are the EDs, uh, who sit on the board of many of our organizations in our movement and our movement ecosystem, who gets funding um, to lead campaigns, to do work. Um, and, you know, for my own experience, I have uh, countless, unfortunately, of experiences where I was in a coalition room and I was often the the youngest, and I was often the only woman, the only immigrant, the only undocumented person when I was undocumented. And what that meant often is my ideas were not taken seriously. My strategic thinking um, wasn't uh, heard. You know, I, I have many situations where I will say like, I think that this is what we should do when it comes to this strategy, or this is my idea. And it will be disregarded. Another man in the room will, articulate the same thing I said, and then it will be a great idea. And everybody wanted to organize around it. Or I can think of the countless times um, where um, I notice a funder treating uh, uh, me differently than they would treat uh, older uh, men who were leading organizations or older women also leading organizations, uh, particularly white folks. So, you know, I think that we just have to be real about uh, the race, class, and gender dynamics in the work that we do. And unfortunately, like, let's face it, they still manifest themselves um, in, in our spaces. And, you know, I will say that for, uh, for many of us leading organizations, then for me, it always became uh, one of the mo big motivators to think about how I am showing up, how I'm leading, uh, how I am making decisions about uh, who to hire in, um, in our organizations or in United We Dream in this case, who was on the board, uh, who was in director level roles and making decisions, um, and what is the support and the investment that many um, of our leaders uh, need, you know, and I, I would always say this, if we're, if we are aiming to build uh, movements led by working class folks, black people, brown people, we have to acknowledge that these folks often uh, come uh, not only from poverty um, and struggling in many different ways financially, uh, but also um, many people, uh, you know, don't have access to school or haven't had the opportunity for educational attainment. Um, and, and all of that needs to be part of how we think about the strategies of supporting folks. So for us, you know, at United We Dream, it's being like, regardless of your education, 
you have an entry point opportunity to be not only a leader, a volunteer, but eventually to be on our staff, to be on our board of directors, to be part of our um, uh, National Leadership Committee, which is the field leaders that represent uh, the different local groups uh, that make up the United We Dream Network. Um, and that meant that we also needed to build the robust and intentional structures for coaching and training. And it does mean that like you got, you cannot have assumptions about the um, skills or the knowledge that people have. You know, none of us, uh, as uh, as we've talked about, like none of us uh, were born woke. So uh, training around uh, political education, understanding um, the history of this country, you know, rooted in genocide, rooted in white supremacy, rooted in systematic racism, uh, but also building the skills. Um, and, you know, we have created structures where staff uh, have people that we are building up in our teams. Often, uh, we don't have the people who exactly meet all of the qualities that we'll, we will need on a job, but that's exactly what we want. Because as an organization accountable to immigrant young people, our job is to develop those folks into the leaders and visionaries and strategists that this country needs and that our community needs. And that means that it takes you know, a lot of work for us to be able to do that and intentionality about how we built um, those uh, systems out. But it also meant for me um, that we do need to have accountability conversations, whether it's with peer leaders, uh, with sometimes um, our funder partners, um, that the way that, that all of these isms show up in the way that we do work, in, in our work, in our coalitions, in our campaigns, that it should not be. And we need to have conversations about accountability to our values from a place of constructive um, uh, and principle struggle mm -hmm. and being able to move forward and finding solutions. But also if we do not speak up, then the, the same things get recre recreated. And you know, I often thought about if I don't speak up in this particular situation, then I wonder all of the other women that are experiencing this in this space. Then I wonder about all the, all the other people experiencing this in, in coalition spaces or in our organizations. And so it became really important for us to be able to uh, create also spaces organizationally where people can lift this up. And, you know, we come from communities and I relate to, uh, to this with NZ, like, you know, you want to take on every single opportunity. You also don't want to rock things up. You don't want to shake things up. You are afraid that if you speak up, something may happen to you. And I think that that is some of the some of the conditioned tendencies that we're also transforming in our organization. So for me, it was always important to speak up and to challenge um, when these things were happening and to make sure that we were providing the support for folks in leadership or in the entry points of our pipeline um, to address all of these issues that manifest themselves. So appreciate that. And it's very consistent with this idea that, you know, what's needed is not, is, is the support for folks, but also challenging structures that oppress folks, that both of those things are necessary, not just one. And Sam, I'm wondering if you want to reflect on, on that same, same question. Yeah. I mean, I would think I'm going to be, I'm going to speak speak very candidly uh, with the hopes that like you, people receive this in the spirit that it is being offered. Um, I think that there's often a desire, if, sometimes if it's a high net worth individual or if it's a foundation to equate access to resources or having money with intelligence or a strategy um, and so, or leadership. Right. And and the idea and then you add ego on top of that, baby. Um, and so, again, it's the idea that uh, you, he or she who has the purse strings uh, controls the strategy uh, and should be leading us out of a, a particular into or out of a particular situation. And I, I, I'm not saying that the person who has access to resources is not the best person, um, but it's not because, uh, it's not the best person to lead, but it is often not because they have money. Um, and so, I mean, I I, the realities of running an organization, the realities of having a staff uh, to sustain this work um, are present. They never leave our mind. And so thinking about the balance of um, 
generating resources in order to continue to do this work um, with and you know maintaining these relationships even when there are times where uh, what is being offered in terms of tactics, what is being offered in terms of strategy, don't necessarily um, perfectly align with the world that we're trying to build, with the wins that we're trying to receive for our people. And so with not having relationships, right, and not having alternatives uh, to go and resource our movement, um, often put young leaders, working class leaders, queer leaders, leaders in geographies that people don't see as battlegrounds until they do see them as battlegrounds, right? Um, that that feels like a significant hurdle um, that, and that um, also requires some leadership development in order to, to, to address. I would argue that I'm still learning, um, you know, how to say no um, or how to center or how to communicate my expertise and my relationships uh, with the people that I'm organizing with as the, um, sort of the North Star, right? As the thing that should be setting our course, that should be setting our path and not, uh, you know, what aligns with a particular donor's priorities for this, uh, you know, funding cycle. Um, and that's a real thing. I, I mean, I offer it because it's not as easy as good people and bad people, right? Uh, it's not as easy as, you know, you take the money and have integrity or you don't, right? And then you lose or your staff goes and quits because they have to pay bills, et cetera, that it is much more complicated and nuanced and it is, there's a tension in that, um, that I think sort of um, helps refine our vision for winning, um, but also refines, you know, our theory of winning, our organizing theory, who we are as leaders, who we are accountable to, et cetera. So um, yeah, I, I think that not being wealthy, <laughs> not having relationships with wealth and capital um, and wanting to sustain and win big and win hard things in places that people have forgotten um, is a real tension uh, that I know a lot of leaders of color are dealing with uh, right now. I'm really glad you brought that into the room. I think it's one of the greatest challenges of leadership and one that isn't spoken as clearly as you just did. And it's exhausting on top of all the other work that has to be navigated, trying to fight for change in the world. Um, that's a heavy emotional burden to carry. So I wanna talk a little bit, speaking of kind of the emotional side of the work, we, we referenced it a little bit earlier, but one of the themes that came up most strongly in our interviews with young folks looking to enter the work or at the early stages of their careers especially, but across the board was the issue of trauma, which has not always been, um, certainly in some of the organizing traditions I came up in, fully acknowledged or recognized as kind of a core component in the way that I think it has been in the organizing that both of you have been doing. So, um, how have you dealt with that in your organizing with folks dealing with centuries of racist oppression in Georgia, with undocumented youth facing unending, you know, really existential attacks? Like, what's the practice of what it looks like to see people's whole beings and work with their experiences in a real way? Um, yeah, Christina, do you want to start with that? I mean, I think that, you know, this is um, in connection to what I was raising before and that when we think of our organizing, we ought to think about the whole person. And, you know, it's not that we're undocumented one day and then the next day we're women and then the next day we're <laughs> working class people. Like we're all of, we're all of it uh, all the time. And I think that for uh, black, brown bodies uh, and people that come from uh, working class uh, backgrounds, uh, this is, you know, the, the, the burden of our lives uh, ev every time and all day. And so I think it's important in our organizing and the way that we approach this is to one, like, let's acknowledge, like, 
we come, you know, all of us have had some lived experience have been socialized uh, around and within these systems. And there's a lot of transformation that needs to happen in our organizations. So our organizations ought to be part of that transformation. And I wanna be clear, it's not the whole because we're not in a place to be able to do that. Um, and there are you know, other places within our ecosystem that uh, are able to play different roles. So when I think about what we've done with young people, I think about the place that we've created where folks can feel safe, where people can share stories, where people can also feel and celebrate who they are. Because part of what we do in our organizing sp spaces, beyond the training, beyond you know finding issues that we get like really excited about fighting for and building a vision of justice and freedom for all people, what we're also doing is dismantling the lies that this country and all of these systems repeatedly tell our people that we are not worthy, that we cannot have access to XXX, that we don't matter, uh, that we don't belong here. And so part of what United We Dream led was an intervention to that narrative and to that rhetoric and to those systems that perpetuate that kind of violence and hatred against our communities. So in a United We Dream space, you always felt like you are beautiful. You're an immigrant and you're proud. You're undocumented and unashamed, queer uh, and unafraid. And that, and that was a key part. And I think that that's a key part of movement organizations that we need to disrupt the lies uh, that are being fed through many systems um, against uh, our communities. Um, and, and the second thing, you know, it's that we, um, we really need to think about, uh, yes, the trauma, but also the healing and the resilience, and they're all true. Um, and at United We Dream, when we integrated our healing within our organizing model, we also understood, like, we, you know, we are not an organization that has um, a network of therapists that can be matched with uh, the membership of United We Dream and work with them. And we don't have to do that. We don't have to become the everything to our communities. One organization cannot absorb that level of responsibility. So I think understanding, you know, what is our role in the movement? It's important. What is it that we do and what is it that we don't do because we are, we're just not good at it. We're not set up for it. And just have the humility and the strategic lens that there are others in our movement who can do that. So we partner with universities, we partner with um, mental health associations, particularly those led by a people of color. Um, and we started to create partnerships and funneling people into different programs um, of mental health and healing and working with other par partners that were also leading trainings um, and support for uh, how to deal with conflict, uh, how to uh, also have conversations around restorative justice in our communities, because it is real that as people that have been harmed, we also harm other people and no one is free from doing that. Uh, to the, you know, there are different levels of degree to what happens, but we are all, you know, we're all guilty in that way. And it takes a lot of work to transform that, but there are tools in our movements and organizations that are leading amazing work on this. And we are doing a lot of that work um, of transformation uh, within, um, within our communities. Uh, but understanding the role that we can play and how then we leverage partners, partnerships practitioners that are already within the ecosystem uh, to be able to support our communities and to celebrate their resiliency, uh, you know, to celebrate that we're not just like victims or survivors of oppression, um, but that we are also joyful and that we are also beautiful and that our stories and our lives matter. And so part of it has also been having parties, having a culture and art within our programs. Now, United We Dream, we instituted our undocumented spotlight where we bring artists from undocumented communities to share their art, to share their gifts with our community and to bring joy. And I think that that is also important to be able to lift up um, in our work. Mm, really powerful. Um, Ense, similar question for you. Um, I will say, you know, a couple things. I'll be quick, but one, um, modeling that is a part of my leadership, like modeling a a restorative, like a a, a, a humility, but also the idea that like I don't know everything, mm -hmm. and that we're constantly learning. Um, 
let me tell you, I get, uh, I, you know, I mess up people's pronouns. Um, I, when I'm not thinking, still call things crazy. Um, and I've been told that that is ableist language. Um, and, you know, I self-correct and apologize in front of my people so that folks know that the expectation isn't perfection, uh, that the expectation is sort of accountability and, um, and generative, right? That we, this is a place where we learn and we grow and we stretch and we are stretched. Um, and so I think that, you know, I, I will be honest that I don't have all of the answers. Um, we had a young organizer die by suicide um, in the aftermath of this. Um, election cycle. And I was distraught and did not know how to console um, the, the organizers and his peers. Uh, so I asked for help, <laughs> right? Um, we had a senior staff person who was in a fiduciary position harm us as an organization. And um, every, you know, I wanted to figure out how to restore the organization, get our money back, but also not subject this person to significant time in prison um, because that didn't align with our values and is sort of contrary to the work um, that we do around abolition and decarceration. Um, and so I brought in help, <laughs> right? Uh, we brought in movement elders um, and people who have wrestled with this. And so again, the idea is that, um, you know, if we believe that broken crayons still color, um, mm -hmm. and that, uh, that there is, a, that we want to be a movement home and an organizing home and a political home for uh, people of color, uh, for young folks, for queer people, for women and femmes, then you know, these are the things that we have to do in order to uh, create on ramps. Uh, and so, you know, we often do not assume that people share our language. So we publish, you know, um, uh, uh, dictionaries or thesaurus or like we publish a list of um, explanations for the terms that we use uh, when we're doing pretty public meetings. And so, yeah, I think the idea is, um, we want to create a space where all of our folks can come uh, and feel welcome, can pick up their shovel, can find their place, can find their lane. Um, and perf again, perfection isn't the goal, uh, that it's progress. Uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. There's a lot of beauty and compassion in that response. Thank you for that. Um, so it will not surprise you to know that we have a lot of audience questions now, which are pretty uh, profound. So I'm going to go to them in a second. So my last question while I sort through those for both of you is um, a little bit about this huge moment that we find ourselves in history. And um, I was very moved and say by one of the interviews um, you did, which I thought was super, the way you handled it was just incredible, where you demanded that Democrats deliver for the folks who delivered for them. Um, and gave them power in DC, you know, ending the Philip, whatever is necessary to do that, the technical stuff. And then, Christina, I've seen firsthand how you've been very unafraid to shake things up, um, push, you know, allies to do what they need to do. But I've also seen both of you play the inside game in a highly skillful way and kind of do this inside outside thing and kind of navigate all of that, um, which I think is a very underappreciated part of leadership. You know, it's like navigating all of those currents. So I wonder if you could speak to that, but also maybe more broadly too, if you have thoughts on given what we are up against, are there particular aspects of leadership that um, we need to cultivate in ourselves and the movement? Like what is leading now in this time look like in this circumstance? Um, I'll go. Yeah. Now we'll switch it up for the people. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that um, one, I, uh, I I never operate with the assumption that I'm going to get a second invite. 
<laughs> so <laughs> it's like mm, they probably will never invite me back so why not be radically honest in this moment and say what we need and say what we mean uh because you know this will be my last time uh so one and that's not it with and i say that not with the burning bridge energy but with the um, shoot my shot energy um, is, you know, one, how we approach these opportunities, storytelling opportunities, organizing opportunities, et cetera. I think, two, um, thinking about inside, outside, and not trying to get inside so that we can make friends with defenders of the status quo. But part of it is so that, again, we're humble enough to know that there are still things that we can't, that we need to learn. Um, that one of the things that I have witnessed and experienced is movement, uh, you know, outside of the building or outside of the Capitol making demands on policymakers um, on behalf of ourselves and our families and our communities. And then when we get a champion elected or to become an insider, that we're wholly and completely unprepared to govern. Um, and so one of the things as I think about my leadership, uh, I often take our staff through this sort of mental exercise and, and member leaders or mental exercise about, you know, what happens when you are queen for, like not even queen for a day, but when you are queen, right? Um, how will we rule? How will we govern, et cetera? And so thinking about, it's not just about the win, but it's about the win and then defending that win uh, beyond sort of one election cycle or whatever that is. And again, what happens when you are on the inside? Um, I think that, um, I think for us, it just shows that we're serious about winning, that we, it's not about sort of, you know, burning it down, um, that we come from vulnerable communities and we are often vulnerable. And so, uh, but we want to win, uh, we want to lead and we wanna show what compassionate leadership looks like. We wanna show what accountable leadership looks like, like give us the gavel, give us the resources because we can do this. Um, and, you know, one of the things in Southern Girl, so, you know, Bible Belt, forgive us, you study to show yourself approved, right? And so the thing is we prepare ourselves so that like, there's no doubt in my mind, there was no doubt in my mind that we were gonna win in 2018 and Georgia was gonna give America its first black woman governor uh, in the 200 and almost 50 years of this experiment. Um, and that did not happen, um, but again, uh, in the aftermath of the theft of Georgia's gubernatorial seat uh, in 2018, we have continued to show the country how to lead uh, from the outside and from the inside. And I think that that's super important that we are getting city council people elected. We're getting school board people elected. We're building a proper pipeline um, for leadership that is homegrown, indigenous, organic talent for folks who love us and who know us. And I think that that's really important. We were having a conversation earlier this morning and someone questioned the wisdom, like, and say you're recruiting all of these 21 year olds to run for a school board because we've seen conversations among school board members who are completely clueless to how virtual learning and this pandemic moment that we're in, how it's impacting young learners, young students. And there's no one at the table, no one in that conversation who sees themselves as like a student, they all see themselves as student advocates, but none of them are anticipating um, education policy and how to teach in this moment and how learning is happening in this moment and how socialization is happening in this moment from the perspective of a student. So why not run a 21 year old who just graduated from the local high school for school board to make sure that we have someone on the inside that knows us, loves us, understands our priority, understands what it looks like to win. So. I love the commitment to radical transformation and winning. Right. Right. <laughs> that combination is like so beautiful, beautifully put. Um, Christina? 
Lots, plus, plus to everything that Enzo said. And, you know, I'll speak uh, on, on two things. One is like, you know, how I've navigated this and um, how does it connect to like leadership? Um, and I think that, you know, one is that for me, and I think as leaders, as organizers, it's always really important to not know the place that we're operating from. And to what Enzo said uh, before, in this moment, we actually need to come from a place of power because it was the people that we organized and that we mobilized to vote, young people, black and brown women, uh, communities of color broadly, that delivered this election, that, that clearly rejected um, the, the Trump administration and that agenda and that vision of the country. And so from that place of power is that we need to you know, operate from. When we think about our campaigns, when we think about how we push the new administration and Congress to deliver on the victories that we need for our communities and to the commitments that many of them made in an election um, and to be able to like really uh, put in practice the fact that the work does not end when the elections wrap up. It actually is when the work intensifies more because now is the time for us as organizers, movements and communities to remind folks and push folks to deliver on the things that our communities need. Um, and so for me, that is important. Let's remember, we're operating from a place of power. We mm -hmm. deliver this election. The second thing is accountability. Who am I accountable to? Every time that I had meetings, whether it's like, you know, President Obama, or people at Congress, whether that was uh, leadership at the House or the Senate, it wasn't Christina speaking for herself. I was there in representation of the members of United We Dream, close to a million members that I know I was accountable to. And that I was there not only to speak about their experiences, their vision, um, and what we wanted, but also to leverage the power that we had and that we have built with other allies along the way. So I think accountability is important, understanding that we're not operating by ourselves. We're accountable to our members. We're accountable to our leaders. We're accountable to our communities. So when you're in that room and you got to create some tension, you're doing that for the love of your community, for the love of your people. And you must do it even if they're not gonna invite you the next time. Even if you're gonna be put on the doghouse like I was a couple of times by democratic leadership. Um, and it was okay, we were able to overcome that because of the power that we're building. The third thing I will say to this point is that we cannot confuse access with power. Having meetings, being invited to the meetings, it's not because, it doesn't mean that you're gonna get everything that you want. In fact, sometimes I have found these meetings that they're, they're created so that they can manage us, manage movements, manage our expectations, manage our demands. Um, and so let's not confuse you being invited to the meeting to you having power. And as organizers and strategists, that goes hand in hand with understanding what is the power that we don't have and that we have. Because I often have seen the mistake made by advocates and by others of either overestimating the power that we have or underestimating the power that we have. Let's just be real and have a sober analysis about the power that we have and the power that we don't so that we can develop strategies. And when we show up in those rooms, we know the power that we're playing with. And we know when to create tension, when to use carrots, when to use the sticks, because if we don't know that, then we're going to have miscalculations that can lead to a lot of harm in our communities. And you know, I can think of many examples within the immigration uh, reform bills um, and how those have played out over the years. Um, and I think about, you know, more broadly about this moment, Deepak, it's such a juicy question because I actually think that we are in an unprecedented moment of opportunity as organizers and as movements. Thanks to the, the, the work and the movement and the leadership led by Black folks, the Movement for Black Lives, the, the beautiful uprising that we saw last year that resulted not only from the killings of Black people, but the, but the layers of trauma and the layers of the pandemic. But the country is having a completely different conversation when it comes to racism. More than before, over 70% of Americans 
think of racism as a big problem in this country. And in my own lifetime in this country, you know, I've been living here for over 20 years. I don't feel that we've had this kind of debate and opening in the culture, in the narrative and the political space. And that creates an unprecedented opportunity for us to be unapologetic about a vision of racial justice, to be unapologetic about um, a vision of economic justice for all people. The second thing is that we also are in a moment where the forces of capitalism, the forces of white supremacy have shamelessly exposed themselves in ways that I don't think the country has seen or that it has captured the attention of the country. The events of January 6th, um, I think are in everybody's mind. And I think that we have to confront what we're up against. And these are the forces of white supremacy. And those are the forces of capitalism. And we have to be sober about those. And if we turn the page again, because this country is really good about forgetting. If we turn the page again, I think that we will be making the same mistake. So the opportunity that we have as movement leaders, as organizers, is to actually ensure that Americans don't forget what we're up against, that we do not turn the page and that we actually use this to organize um, all of the people that are unorganized right now, which is a mass amount of people and to bring them together to work towards the vision of a better, of a better country. Mm. Thank you for that. And I feel like a lot of what you both laid out is sort of the elements of what a curriculum for leadership today should look like. Um, you really broke it down in a very, very clear way. That was some great teaching. Um, so we have a like very, I feel like we're getting a lot of very practical questions for advice. And I wanna kind of group a couple of them together for you. One of them is just navigating the realities of racism and sexism in the world, in the movements, and has to do with, in response to pressure that our organizations or our movements or whatever don't look like the country, that sometimes there's a dynamic of tokenism that is actually not a sign of progress or can be disabling. And also a kind of issue around when people raise, as you've talked about interrupting racism and sexism, that there's a cost that people feel like gets, um, that they pay for, for raising those issues. And so kind of how you've navigated those questions in your own leadership of like being forceful about what's going wrong, but um, knowing that there's a price to be paid. And you've spoken to some of this already, but I'm curious if you have any other advice for these younger leaders who are asking about how to navigate these treacherous waters. You wanna start and say? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll say that like my race, gender and class um, are not, like despite all of the evidence, uh, despite what the dominant society tells me about myself, that those are things to be celebrated, that they're part of who I am. And I think that I am fortunate to live to be in a village uh, of people that hold me down, um, that you know I can look into their eyes uh, and see um, that you know that I'm not served by reducing any of us to these essential things. This you know again our race, our gender, sexuality, etc. Um, I'll also say that. You know, I use those things to identify problems, to sort of assess problems, to give it a name, to say what the thing is that we are organizing against. And we use race, gender, and class in developing the solutions, right? And so if I can identify how race, gender, and class are, um, being used, or anyway, I use race, gender, and class to identify the problem. Um, that we, those are the lenses that we assess the world as it is and say what the problem is. I think one of the things that we have a, a problem, one of the opportunity areas uh, is around calling a thing a thing. That is racist, that is sexist, 
that is messed up, right? And we should do something about it. Um, and so I think that because of my gender, because of my race, uh, because of class, I have been able to, I, and how I've been treated because of those things at different points in my life and in my career and in my organizing, um, I see them as lenses. I mean, they are a part of who I am. Um, they make up the full, the totality that is NSA, and that's the case for all of us. Um, but I use them as lenses through which we can evaluate problems and through which we can develop solutions. Hmm. Thank you for that. Yeah. Christina, advice for young organizers out there from you. I mean, I will share some practical things. Um, and, you know, I agree uh, completely with everything that Ens has said. Um, you know, one that um, our trainees need to include all of these things, right? Like we do not, um, we do not have like a schools, you're not getting the uh, class, race, gender analysis that we need to have. And, and that we need to have to, you know, quite frankly, sometimes being able to like recognize that like, oh, okay, that's racist or like that's sexist. And, uh, you know, we often like, either don't know the meaning of that or we use the words um, lightly without like knowing what they mean. Um, and, and I think that part of the training actually needs to empower folks and give the tools to folks to identify and to be able to call things out and call things like into conversation and principal struggle in our organizations. Um, and, you know, I'll just share a quick example. I remember us having a training around um, violence and, and creating harm. And many young women in the room, and I'm talking about high schoolers and folks in the early 20s, were having kind of an aha moment when they realized that a lot of things that it's okay in their homes about the way that women behave and about the way that men behave and sort of those acceptable behaviors, that they were actually violent that they were actually oppressive. And it wasn't until we went through this training that many women were able to actually identify and say like, oh, I'm experiencing this in my household. I'm experiencing this in friendships. I'm experiencing this in my, in my romantic relationship. Um, and so I think that those are you know, important things um, to include as part of our trainings because we can't assume that people know or that have the tools to identify. The second thing is that um, creating structurally in our organizations, the spaces and the processes and the practices for that to, for, for the behavior to be able to be spotted, corrected, addressed, and for it to have accountability and healing and transformation. And, you know, that didn't happen on day one when we started as an organization. It was through growing pains and learning. But I think what was important about me and the leadership and how we showed up when these moments happened is that we were not paralyzed by the fear that we did not know how to deal with something. And we were not only there to listen to what the HR attorneys had to say <laughs> or about what the lawyers had to say. You know, like that's an important perspective as organizational leaders and managers of organizations within the <laughs> in nonprofit infrastructure. That's obviously important, but it's not everything. So we, you know, took perspectives from that side, but also from folks that were experts in um, issues of harassment or issues of violence or issues of creating safe spaces um, and um, healing um, and restorative justice. And, you know, investing in not only the training tools, but also in us learning ourselves how to create those places and how to do constant trainings. You know, United We Dream, we now do at least twice a year trainings with all of our staff and all of our leaders about having safe spaces. And that means uh, safety from sexual harassment, safety from other kinds of harassment in the organization and in our communities. Uh, and that's important. So repetition doesn't hurt. We need to remind people of the processes of like, when you see something, who do you talk to? How do you bring it up? What is the next step? How is the organization going to address it? And those processes need to be transparent and need to be known so that actually you have people in organizations being able to uphold those processes and those practices. I really appreciate that both of you kind of reframe this to a question of like, what do individuals do? To how is this being held by a community, a community of practice, a set of structures, a set of processes, 
um, I think that's key intervention for how some of these patterns get broken. So I'm gonna give you a last chance to, um, there's so many more questions. I should say there's just a tremendous amount of love and appreciation for you both and your leadership. So that uh, needs to be said to you in the, in the questions, but there's questions here about um, how you balance, I'm gonna give you the choice to what you wanna answer because you can't answer all these. There's a question about how to balance short-term and long-term, like there's such an urgency of now and it takes this long-term investment in building, how do you do that? There's a question about your own optimism and how do you cultivate that given the level of stuff that is happening? Um, there's a question about the sort of long war on communities of color and working people in this country that we now seem to be in and kind of what you see as being the critical interventions for us. It's not just one election, right? As we've talked about, it's this also kind of how to think about the attacks on voting rights in Georgia right now and Congress and all that. So any of those that you want to speak about in your last, feel free to, to go where you'd like in your last comments. Um, we'd like to start. Go ahead, Christina. Um, you know, so I will say, um, I feel like part of what feels like it connects to like the three questions that you raised um, is that um, where I find the hope and the inspiration to keep going is also where we find the answers of how to move forward and how to fight, um, you know, what we're up against and for the vision that we have. Um, and, and that it's in community. Um, I, you know, I, I feel like in my role as ED and as an organizer for many years, sometimes you get caught up in all the work that you need to do fundraising and you're know, talking to your funder partners and uh, you got to talk to Democrats and, you know, the um, state legislators and, and reporters. And so there's, there is, there's an easy path to, dis, to be distant to what's happening in the, at the grassroots level with communities. And I think that that is the most um, important thing for us that, you know, even though we need to be operating on the 360 sometimes with the eagle vision, uh, that we also need to be like snakes in the grassroots and be with our community. And I think for me, when I, every time I um, needed to reground myself, to gain hope, to gain perspective, because I may be feeling tired of, quite frankly, you know, pessimistic and afraid about what we are up against. Um, I always found that power and inspiration in community when I saw young people fighting to stop deportations, when I saw young people coming together to create mutual aid to support their undocumented family, friends, and neighbors when they were left out of COVID, um, and or having um, parties where we celebrated uh, the talent of immigrant DJs in our communities. Uh, so that, uh, to me, is where always like the hope uh, came from and the regroundness of why I do this work, but also it is in community where I think we find the answers for how to move forward. So as leaders, as organizers, you know, whenever in doubt or whenever in fear, leadership is about bringing folks together and finding clarity and certainty in moments of uncertainty. Um, and I always found that certainty and that clarity when we came together, when I didn't feel like I needed to figure it out all by myself because I didn't. Um, and quite frankly, like the best ideas come as a result of community work and community dreaming and community visioning. So, you know, I don't think that um, I've ever been the person that thinks that I could lock myself up in a room and come up with the greater strategy. Uh, it's actually bringing people together and dreaming um, with our communities about what we want, but also how to get there. Thank you, Christina. And say? Yeah, um, I will uh, take... Uh, a page out of Christina's book and try to anchor my response in something practical uh, as well. Um, yeah, I, you know, listen, I think the joy is generative, um, that it, it helps to sustain movements in ways that anger doesn't. Um, uh, and listen, I'm very good at being angry. I'm super clear about the things that I hate and the people. No, that's not true. I don't hate people. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, one of the things that I'm constantly having to mine, you know, my thoughts and my memories and my interior life for is like, what makes me happy? Mm -hmm. What is it that I want? Um, and then, you know, going after it. So I think that that's just my work. 
right? Uh, again, it's very easy for me to tell you a list of things that I hate. Um, less, less, it takes a lot more time. I mean, I'm getting better at it. Again, it's talk about what my vision for the world is and what it is that I actually want and what, and not, like not constantly sort of rebelling and pushing back against something. So number one. Number two, we try to cultivate that in our organizations and in our work and in our organizing to sustain us. So very simple things like when outside was open, we never had a meeting where we didn't have food, music, and childcare mm. at all of our in-person meetings, that they were a staple. So our organizers knew that the expectation was that not only did they have a pop, right, or an agenda, right? So what's the purpose of this meeting? What are the outcomes that we're expecting? And what's the process? How are we gonna go about getting that outcome? But they also know that they needed to have a playlist um, <laughs> and they needed to source food and nourishment and childcare, that that was a part of the culture that we were trying to create, that we didn't want people to feel like those, that they had, that those, imperatives, those human imperatives uh, were in any way competition um, for the organizing that we were trying to do. Um, and so, yeah, we're as thoughtful and intentional about creating Jun, uh, Jun joy and fun. <laughs> I merged them together, now they're done. Um, but that, that was, that is, you know, a part of our organizing. And I think that that's how, what sustains me. I get excited. Um, I mean, you know, people who know us and know our work know that we came back to the office around Labor Day in 2020 um, after deep consultation with public health experts and our board and our staff and our volunteers. Uh, I mean, physical distancing and all of that, but we came back to the office and people, I would look forward to like, what's on the like what's on the menu a but also b you know giving people an opportunity to share their culture with us share what they're listening to etc it's an opportunity to get to know each other get to know ourselves and um yeah we're intentional about cultivating that experience and again it also helps us shift and pivot i'll give this one last example before i end um we had plans to go to every dorm move-in day, every county fair, every uh, you know uh, music festival in 2020 to register people to vote. We had a goal of registering 100,000 young people and people of color to vote. Then the pandemic hit, and that was not an option for us. And so uh, we simply had to shift and pivot um, our tactics. But our goal was the same, like, and our strategy is the same. Registering people is an opportunity to have organizing conversations and is an invitation to invite people into the democratic process, but into our organizing issue, organizing, electoral organizing, like political home. So we found Twitch. It's talking to high school guidance counselors, talking to parents and saying, I don't know what we're going to do. Where are we going to find the 17 and a half year olds to register them to vote? And they're like, we're sorry, we can't help you. All of our kids are watching other kids play video games on Twitch. <laughs> it was like, say more. Um, I got a quick Twitch tutorial from the folks on our staff who I now realize were also on Twitch. Um, and we had uh, our first Twitch the Vote activation on National Voter Registration Day. We registered 9,000 people in one day. We did Twitch the Vote again, brought in professional video game players, these esports players, activists, organizers, young people, first time voters. They were live correspondents, uh, like they were acting as correspondents from the polling locations, like, hey, it's your first time voting, tell us about it, et cetera. We have half a million unique viewers on election day on our Twitch channel, right? And so again, thinking about Centering Joy community, we wanna still have these conversations. We still wanna be in community with you. We just need to find folks where they are. And if we have a little fun, a uh, little good natured ribbing, um, some trash talk, uh, then that makes it just the, the experience that much more rich. Um, and so we're constantly looking for opportunities to inject the fun, the joy into our organizing to sustain us because the days are long, the nights are long, <laughs> the years are long. So. Yeah. Well, I think joy and community is the taproot for where we find the breakthrough strategy and where we find the energy for this long struggle that we're in. It's just a beautiful place to kind of bring 
this program together. And on behalf of all my colleagues at the School of Labor and Urban Studies, at uh, Colin Powell School at City College, I wanna say, and say, Christina, thank you for doing this session today, but more so for really modeling the kind of generous, strategic, and soulful leadership that um, this whole project aspires to support. I know it's not always an easy road, although you both have made it look easy. And I hope you can feel the love and support of this broader community for you and your leadership and appreciation for the work that you do. Um, I wanna once again invite folks that there'll be a part two to this conversation that my friend and colleague, Gary LaMarche will be hosting uh, on March 2nd. That will be a discussion with Rana Epting of moveon.org and Maurice Mitchell with the Working Families Party. I hope you will tune in and uh, thank you. Thank you both so much. Thanks everyone for signing in. What a wonderful discussion. Really appreciate you all. Thank, thank you everyone. You.